amateur video captures two snowbird jets taking off in British Columbia today. A mission meant to inspire Canadians isolated at home takes a sickening turn. One jet suddenly nose diving. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, a Canadian Forces snowbird is killed after a jet crashes to the ground. So this uh, accident today really uh, shakes us to our core. The terrifying moments witnessed, the questions for investigators. Canada's first clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine gets the green light. This is the way that we're going to get out of this. Travelers grounded by the pandemic say their insurance is useless. I deserve to get my money back. CBC News investigates. And the new face of the American political divide. We live in a country of freedom. The message behind the mask. This is The National. The Canadian Forces snowbirds have been touring the country to raise spirits during this pandemic. But tonight, the snowbirds are mourning the death of a team member killed when one of their jets crashed in British Columbia. Captain Jen Casey was a public affairs officer with the Snowbirds, originally from Halifax, Nova Scotia, a province touched yet again by tragedy. Tina Lovegreen begins our coverage from Kamloops tonight. All eyes were fixated on the sky as the Snowbirds took off this morning, but then the unexpected. We just crashed. Oh my God. At first I thought the barrel roll was maybe a trick that the pilot was doing. Um, but seeing the pilot eject and then the, the plane take a nosedive um, obviously wasn't a trick. Witnesses took these videos showing two puffs of black smoke coming from the plane. Then the jet came crashing down into the front yard of a house. Halifax-born Captain Jen Casey was on board and died in the crash. She joined the armed forces in 2014 and the Snowbirds four years later. A former journalist, she worked her way up to public affairs officer with the Snowbirds. The other pilot landed on the roof and survived. Amazingly, I don't know how he survived. I don't know how he survived that. Because I don't think his parachute opened. Blocks away, Dana Hings and her daughter jumped into their truck and were one of the first on scene. There were already two other people there, um, uh, one doing chest compressions. The debris stretched over three different homes. It was uh, rather flabbergasting to hear the boom go off and come running outside and see smoke uh, billowing out from his house and so on. Dozens of first responders reacted quickly and the city also quick to offer assistance. And so this uh, accident today really uh, shakes us to our core, but we uh, will uh, respond to it in every way that we can. In an Instagram story posted on Saturday, a Snowbirds pilot said the team was dealing with some electrical malfunctions. They also had said the weather wasn't suitable, with some low cloud cover making it unsafe to fly through. What caused this crash is still unknown and to be investigated. And Tina joins us now from Kamloops. You've learned more about the condition of the other snowbird. We have Ian and the Prime Minister offered his condolences to the families as well as to the entire Canadian Forces snowbird team, adding that for the past two weeks they've been flying over Canada, uplifting the nation's spirit during this difficult time. And uh, the other member who was on board who survived, we know that his injuries are serious but not life-threatening, and he has been identified as Captain Richard McDougall, a 34-year-old from New Brunswick, and we're hoping to learn more about his condition in the coming days. Ian? All right, Tina Lovegreen in Kamloops tonight. Let's go now to Anita Bath in Vancouver. And Anita, you've been talking to experts to get some insight into where the investigation could go from here. Ian, a team from the Royal Canadian Air Force sent from Ottawa to look into what happened. Key to that could be any communication from the aircraft in those final moments. That could shed light on any problems they may have had. And the fact we know there is one survivor, well, that pilot will be key in the investigation as well. But you can see here the two planes are in formation together and then there's a problem and one plane ends up doing a steep climb to a higher altitude. What you're trained to do is if there is a problem, say with the engine or with power on takeoff, you're instructed to zoom or to climb up to as much altitude as you can. You want to convert your airspeed into altitude and then either sort the problem out or if you have to, eject. And in the long history of the snowbirds, there have been other crashes. 
Yes, in fact, before this, there have been eight other deaths. The planes have been in service since 1963. Over the years, there's been a lot of talk about replacing the jets. In fact, they were once supposed to retire this year and then a decision to modernize them and keep them going until 2030. Upgrades do happen all the time and there is a rigorous maintenance schedule. This footage you see here was posted over the weekend. It appears to show those checks happening. Now, I spoke with several experts today. Some say age has nothing to do with this. Others say that will definitely be part of the investigation. There are airplanes around that are older, but typically those kind of airplanes aren't subjected to a lot of uh, vertical forces. Um, you know, this is one thing that, uh, you know, it's, it's still, it's a difficult thing to maintain an airplane that's older, getting parts. Uh, the engine itself, uh, when I flew the airplane, was quite a reliable engine. Now, I actually spent some time with the victim in this crash, Jen Casey, last summer at the Abbotsford Air Show. And I distinctly remember her telling me how grateful she was to have that job and how much she loved the Snowbirds and being part of that team. This really is a country that does love that team as well. And people across Canada will be mourning with Casey's loved ones tonight. Ian. All right, Anita, thank you very much. And we will have more on this crash later in the program. But first, on to other news and a great deal of uncertainty tonight at Air Canada after a major announcement from the airline this weekend. Late on Friday, Air Canada revealing it expects to lay off about 20,000 employees next month, fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Ashley Burke now with how the federal government took the news and what it's saying. <laughs> For Air Canada employees today, still so much uncertainty after the company dropped a bombshell on Friday heading into the long weekend. It's definitely uh, historic for us, unfortunately. We've never seen anything like this. In a memo, Air Canada told employees it plans to cut more than half its workforce to survive. It's going to affect people that have been with the company for 15, 20 years, um, depending on where mitigation options go. It's going to affect single moms. It's going to affect people that have moved across the country. Air Canada grounded the bulk of its fleet and says it's losing $22 million a day. The airline says the cuts are a way to conserve cash and deal with the harsh reality that even when the lockdowns lift, the demand won't be the same. I think Air Canada is playing hardball with the Canadian government. Sources say there's frustration within the government that Air Canada didn't warn them cuts were imminent, even after weeks of talks and two new announcements in recent days. That workers across Canada can keep their jobs. The first offering big loans to big businesses, the second extending the wage subsidy program that Air Canada is using to pay workers until the end of the summer. But it wasn't enough. The line in the sand has been drawn by Air Canada saying if you want us to basically maintain our stature, maintain the service levels, maintain the aircraft, maintain the schedule that we had, we're going to need billions to make sure that we're staying in business. Yesterday, the Prime Minister didn't rule out a government bailout, but didn't promise one either, and pointed to the new loans. It is not a, a bailout, it is a, a, a loan that is going to help them get through, uh, but uh, we, we are still working with uh, companies to see uh, who's taking that up. Air Canada hasn't said if it will take the loan. Analysts say that it could take at least three years for the industry to fully recover. Until then, we could see smaller airlines and fewer flights to some communities. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. When flights first started getting cancelled because of the pandemic, people with trip cancellation insurance were told they were the lucky ones. They would get their money back. But as Go Public's Rosa Marcatelli explains, some insurance companies now say, don't bother making a claim. It's been six years since Art Solomonian and his wife Leanne visited Ireland. The couple was planning to go again this month until the pandemic hit and flights were cancelled. Solomonian thought they were covered. They paid almost $300 for trip cancellation insurance on top of the $1,200 fare for the flights home on Air Transat. Now he's wondering if he'll ever see his money. I deserve to get my money back. The travel insurance provider, Manulife in this case, says it's not covering claims when a travel credit has been offered by an airline, even if the policyholder turns it down. Our insurance is there to help those who have suffered an insurable loss, as outlined in the policy purchase, the company tells Go Public. When the airline provides a full credit or voucher, there is no insurable loss. Solomonian isn't the only one. Go Public is hearing from other grounded passengers dealing with other insurance companies being told not to make a claim if they were offered a travel credit. 
I don't see why anybody should be holding on to someone else's money. Marty Firestone calls it a domino effect. Airlines refuse to pay out, so other types of companies do the same. This is the difference between millions of dollars that they would maybe have to reimburse. 71-year-old Solomonian says that's no reason to refuse coverage on a policy he bought in good faith before the pandemic. This is non-transferable, uh, non-refundable. Um, if, if I take ill over the summer and I can never travel again, this, the, these credits are absolutely useless to me. Solomonian is also dealing with a second separate travel claim with RBC Insurance. That one's for the flight to Ireland on Air Canada. He's been told that claim is being processed, but it will take months to find out if it's approved. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. The number of COVID-19 cases in Canada increased again today, but there appear to be some positive signs. Let's take a look at where things stand tonight. There are more than 77,000 confirmed cases and more than 5,800 people have died from it. But there are signs of slowly turning things around. The number of new daily cases has been averaging less than 1,200 for the past week. That's a rate we haven't seen since early April. For now, a flattened curve, but experts want to see it declining. One positive note tonight comes from Canada's chief public health officer, who said more than 38,000 known cases, or 50% of the total, have recovered. A new milestone. So let's put that in some perspective, and we turn to infectious disease expert Dr. Isaac Bogosh. That number of recoveries, the percentage, kind of made headlines earlier today. How significant is it? It's very significant. I mean, it really helps put that 77,000 cases in Canada into perspective. Of course, we know that these are not all active cases and, you know, about half of the people have recovered. And, you know, it's, it's certainly one piece of a much larger puzzle, but certainly an arrow pointing in the right direction. Of course, we're also looking at other metrics as well to paint a bigger picture, like uh, number of new cases per day, number of hospitalizations, the percentage of positive cases amongst all the tests being done and together all those metrics including the number of recovered pick, uh, patients really uh, paint a more holistic picture of how we're doing in the country. I remember talking to you about uh, the COVID-19 story weeks ago maybe it was months ago and and one of the things you were advocating for at that time is more testing for a more complete picture and I assume you still feel that way. I do. I mean, certainly most of the provinces has, have scaled up dramatically and it's made it a lot better. But as we sort of end this tail end of the first wave, we're really going to need uh, tremendous diagnostic capabilities, tremendous contact tracing and surveillance in order to rapidly identify any potential new cases and quickly jump on them before that spirals out of control. So we're really going to need that capability as we move forward because we're still in the pre-vaccine era. And, uh, and certainly we, we've got to jump on this before, uh, before this spirals out of control and, and starts a second wave. All right, Dr. Bogosh, thank you. Anytime. We're learning more tonight about a big leap forward in the race for a vaccine for coronavirus, the first approved to go to human trials here in Canada. Jayla Bernstein explains why it matters, even if it fails. It's a made-in-China solution, soon to be tested on Canadian soil. If these vaccine trials are successful, we can produce and distribute it here at home. Research and development take time and must be done right. But this is encouraging news. Health Canada has approved the first human trial of a COVID-19 vaccine, with an initial phase out of Halifax involving just under 100 participants. It's encouraging, but not a sure bet. One of the lead scientists working on the trial warns that while the vaccine worked on other animals, we still don't know if it'll protect humans. Not everything that gets into clinical trials uh, is successful. In fact, most aren't. So one always has to, uh, to be very cautious about saying, oh, this is the answer. This particular vaccine was developed by CanSino Biologics. It uses a different virus and modifies it to trick the body into producing what it needs to fight off coronavirus. Even if this particular vaccine doesn't end up being the one, it's a sign of progress. You've got to start somewhere. And I think, honestly, what a vaccine represents to both physicians and to people the worldwide right now, in the long run, is hope. This represents the 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 way that we can get out of this. And if this vaccine works, there's an advantage to having clinical trials here. A company may say, okay, we're going to produce a vaccine in the US or in Europe and we're going to sell it everywhere. 
but the US or that European country may say, well, you can sell it elsewhere after you fulfill our needs, where if it's made here, uh, Canada can get access amongst the first nations and rather than having to wait its turn based on its population size and its market size. At least 10 other vaccines are in development in Canada. And while this is the first to reach clinical testing here, others are expected to follow. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. This will be a big reopening week for two big provinces. British Columbia will begin phase two on Tuesday. Restaurants and hair salons to restart. Ontario will also let some retail stores open after the holiday, but reopen doesn't mean back to business as usual. Retailers are being forced to adjust their policies to meet new safety requirements. And as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, shoppers are having to change their own behavior too. Directional markers, hand sanitizer, those are rules and routines Canadians are already getting used to. But shopping for clothes and shoes in a pandemic is new territory. At this mountain equipment co-op, shoppers can't try on anything. If they do touch something, uh, we have bins set up around the store where they can deposit the product and then we take it for disinfection before we return it to the floor. Cleaning, physical distancing and signage are now the cost of doing business. We're assuming we are going to have lower foot traffic, but we have a lot of work to do now. We have a lot of cleaning we need to get done. When Aritzia opened its doors in Vancouver for the first time on Friday, customers were eager to come back. I miss shopping a lot. The company is allowing shoppers to browse and touch merchandise for now. The inn is here. Yeah, the inn is on the other side. And shoppers can try on clothes. Every second change room is open, but all items tried on are steamed before they're put back. Some of the measures the CEO hopes will give customers confidence. If they're not having a great experience and, and don't feel safe in the stores, Obviously, they're just going to continue to shop online. As some retailers adapt, others continue to struggle. U.S. retailer J. Crew was the first to seek bankruptcy protection during COVID-19. Then Montreal-based shoe chain Aldo, U.S. department store Neiman Marcus, and the largest yet, J.C. Penney. And there could be more. I, I suspect that we have department store businesses in Canada that are at high risk. Retailers' weaknesses such as debt or lack of online infrastructure are being exacerbated by COVID-19. We will return to the mall, but the question is, will the mall be a different place when we return to it? That's a particular concern in provinces where enclosed malls can't open yet. So while the first wave of retailers has an advantage, they're also under pressure to get it right. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. The tourism industry across the country is also being forced to change. Consider British Columbia. This province usually makes $7 billion a year from international visitors. But as Briar Stewart tells us, with pandemic restrictions, the province is looking at a big loss. The surfers don't mind having this Tofino beach all to themselves, but it's a different story when you run a luxury inn. Here we are looking out due west and due south. This one is currently shut down and 90% of the staff are laid off. The challenges that we face are for sure daunting and, and, and the new normal will be different. Because the new normal for the summer at least means likely few or no international visitors. In 2018, that group spent more than $7 billion in BC. More than 280 cruise ships docked in Vancouver last year, and it's estimated that each ship and all of its passengers pump about $3 million into the local economy. It's not clear whether this summer any cruise ships will be able to come, and that's why the local economy could take a big financial hit. Alfred Esmeyer won't be driving these shuttles anytime soon. My clients have cancelled till the end of August. He thinks he can weather a season with no bookings, but worries about the industry overall. I foresee that quite a few companies will not survive, and they can range from big to small. Destination BC, a provincial crown corporation, normally encourages tourism. So for now we pause, stay in, and dream of later. But for now, it's telling people to stay home. Once more restrictions are lifted, it plans to encourage people to support local. There are things that we can do as British Columbians to ease the pain that has been so severe for our tourism industry. Pretty bird! Not every attraction will be able to woo local tourists, but the Bloedel Conservatory, with all of its exotic birds, hopes to. 
When we reopen, we will be targeting local residents and a lot of families who are looking for things to do outside their homes. Because travel restrictions mean more people will be looking for adventures closer to home. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. To the U.S. now, Donald Trump has stepped up his war of words with Barack Obama. In recent days, Trump's accused his predecessor of criminal conduct. Now he's calling Obama incompetent. Katie Simpson tells us it's in response to Obama's criticism of White House pandemic policy. Never one to walk away from a fight, the president is escalating his feud with his predecessor. Look, he was an incompetent president. That's all I can say, grossly incompetent. Thank you. Donald Trump fired back at Barack Obama after the former president criticized the U.S. response to coronavirus during a pair of commencement speeches. More than anything, this pandemic has fully, finally torn back the curtain on the idea that so many of the folks in charge know what they're doing. A lot of them aren't even pretending to be in charge. Attacks on Obama are nothing new for Trump, but he's ramped up criticism by making evidence-free allegations of widespread criminal activity, a move that's seen as a diversion tactic ahead of the fall election. This was all Obama. This was all Biden. These people were corrupt. The whole thing was corrupt, and we caught them. Lashing out when under scrutiny is a pattern for the president, which critics say was illustrated again with the firing of another government watchdog. This is the dismemberment of accountability in the federal government if it continues. No comment. No Steve comment. Linick was reportedly so investigating much. whether Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had State Department staff performing personal tasks for him and his wife. Trump fired him at Pompeo's urging, though little else is publicly known about why. I don't know if they're going to provide a more robust rationale for why they do it, but I understand it. I don't disagree with it. Democratic lawmakers are not as satisfied and are investigating. If it looks like it's in retaliation uh, for something, that could be unlawful. Linick is the fourth government watchdog to be fired or moved by Trump in the past three months. While the president has the right to hire or fire political appointees, Critics argue he's setting a dangerous precedent trying to evade scrutiny. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Donald Trump has yet to wear a mask in public, and many of his supporters appear to be following his lead. You're not wearing a mask. Why? No, I'm not wearing a mask. Why? Because I don't need a mask. Next on The National, how the mask has become the latest political symbol dividing America. Plus, how did Quebec end up with the worst outbreak in Canada? He seems to play politics, and I don't think that this is his role. We look at the questions around the government strategy and its change in messaging. And later, sharing a meal a driveway apart. Cheers to all my neighbors. It's been awesome. A new neighborhood tradition fit for these times. We'll be right back. Quebec continues to be the province hit hardest by COVID-19. With about 22% of Canada's population, it has well more than half of all infections in the country and more than half of the deaths. Today, with just over 1,100 new confirmed cases being reported across Canada, most provinces have none or relatively few. Ontario has 340 new infections. And then there's Quebec with 737, more than double that number. It is the worst outbreak in Canada. No other province comes close. Terrence McKenna now on how the Quebec government has handled it. Here's Quebec Premier Francois Legault back in the good old days at the beginning of April. His approval rating among Quebecers was then 95%. As we say in English, April showers bring May flowers. He was announcing that he could see light at the end of the COVID-19 tunnel, that the lockdown could be over in a few weeks. Then it all went wrong. The outbreak in Quebec's long-term care facilities exploded. Horror stories appeared of residents abandoned by staff, unable to get to the bathroom for days, even starving to death. Fatalities skyrocketed. Several homes have 100% infection rates among residents and staff. The situation highlighted the large gap between what the Quebec government promised and what it delivered. 
Epidemiologist Gaston Dessert at Laval University has no doubt why Quebec now has by far the worst fatality rate in Canada. The answer is that COVID-19 has really uh, got a hold in long-term care facilities. So uh, th most of the deaths are coming from residents for elderly people. That's a worldwide phenomenon. It, it did affect Quebec uh, uh, harder though. Now Premier Legault's approval rating has dropped 23%, closer to the level of other premiers. This week he seemed defensive when faced with tough questions from reporters. Oui. Pour être clair, encore plus clair. Il n'y a aucune information qui est cachée. Okay. Uh... La presse columnist Patrick Lagasse says that both the public and journalists have grown more skeptical about Quebec government claims. When you promise people on May 1st that you're going to have 14,000 tests by May 8th, and then to this day, you can't test more than 7,000 on average per day, that's a problem. So either you don't promise that, or you promise and you deliver. Legault has had a number of flip-flops. He began by denouncing the use of masks. Bonjour. Then his team showed up this week ostentatiously wearing them. In late April, he flirted with the controversial concept of herd immunity, allowing the infection to spread so that the population develops antibodies. Il peut y avoir une immunité naturelle qui va empêcher une vague. That was on a Thursday. But on the Monday, they mentioned in passing that, oh, you know what, uh, herd immunity, we're not sure if it's working, so uh, we're not basing our strategy on herd immunity. It was a shocking about face. In the early weeks of the outbreak, Premier Legault was helped out by his charismatic wingman, Quebec's public health director, Horacio Arruda. It's embarrassing, a mask. A mask will make your hands go over your face. It gives a sense of false security. Dr. Arruda charmed the press and the public with his folksy style and his ability to simplify complex scientific explanations. Just explain it in a way that people understand. But over time, he seemed to leave science behind and even contradict himself in order to support the government's announced plans. Bonjour. He fully supported the controversial reopening of primary schools outside the island of Montreal, a move that was criticized by medical experts, including the federal government's chief scientific advisor, Mona Nemer. Despite repeated requests, she had seen no plan from Quebec. Écoutez, uh... Je répondrai pas à Madame compte tenu que je considère que je n'ai pas à rendre de compte à, à cette dame, uh, mais à la population du Québec, ça oui, puis à, à mes autorités. Dr. Arruda is the scientific backbone in this government right now. He should have been able to explain in scientific terms why Québec was acting this way. He did not do that. He answered just like a politician from Québec would answer to a politician from Ottawa whose question you didn't like. He seems to play politics, and I don't think that this is his role. Beat me up, Scotty. Beat me up, Scotty. Dr. Arruda seems a bit taken with his own sudden stardom. He appeared in a video performing what he called a quarantine dance with a local rap artist. It was not well received. The La Presse editorial cartoon portrayed him dancing on the roof of a long-term care home as people were dying below. This week, Arruda made a tearful apology. Donc, ça n'a jamais été mon intention de blesser qui que ce soit. Still undaunted, the Quebec government announced a plan to reopen schools in the city of Montreal on May 25th, even as epidemiologists' projections showed that would cause a spike in COVID-19 deaths, up to 150 fatalities per day by July. In that situation, if you increase the number of contacts between uh, people in the society, you will go above this epidemic threshold and then the epidemic will go up again. Under a tidal wave of criticism for his recklessness, Legault announced Thursday that Montreal schools would not reopen after all until August or September. The Premier still hopes to reopen many Montreal businesses on May 25th, praying it will not go wrong again. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto.
The message on masks has shifted, and not just in Quebec, because if you can't keep two meters, six feet apart, they can help prevent the wearer from infecting others. But in the United States, COVID-19 is a partisan issue, and those masks are no exception. Paul Hunter is in Washington, a U.S. city still grappling with a serious outbreak. In Columbia Heights, the Washington, D.C. neighborhood hit hardest by COVID, masks are everywhere. The advice from experts for all, if you want to help slow the spread of the coronavirus here, or for that matter, anywhere in America, it's pretty simple. Put one on. But increasingly in this country, there's another consideration, politics. To wear or not to wear one of these has in many quarters become a matter not just of health and safety, but a matter of who do you believe? Who do you support? And are you on side with the president? Famously, Donald Trump has yet to wear a mask in public, even for symbolic value, even as he's regularly met by those who do wear one. Here, touring a face mask distribution center in Pennsylvania last week. Later, meeting with some of its workers, themselves, unlike the president, masked. Then there's the time he chose not to wear a mask while greeting elderly veterans of the Second World War. In the face of advice from experts, countless Americans have taken note of Trump's lead. Carry on my wayward son. When we went to Pennsylvania last month for one of those Reopen America rallies, signals of strong support for Donald Trump were everywhere. Some did wear masks, many did not. Among those who did, these three, with their assault-style weaponry and a non-COVID reason, for masking up. People argue with it. it is a health and safety matter. You're wearing a mask, for example. That's just to hide my face. Oh. Open up, open up. Others open seem up. to make clear choosing to be mask face. free amid a pandemic was a matter of politics. You're not wearing a mask. Why? No, I'm not wearing a mask. Why? Because I don't need a mask. Why? She didn't cite Donald Trump, but she did borrow his slogan. It's a perspective now run rampant. On Long Island, New York last week, as this reporter covered a similar protest, he was taunted by defiant, mask-free Trump supporters. I think you need to back away from No, me, I got sir. hydroxychloroquine, I'm fine. It's the politicization of everyday life. When every single small gesture becomes freighted with political meaning, uh, then you, it's hard to hold society together. Maybe we've forgotten how to talk to each other. It that perplexes and angers Louisiana opinion writer Rod things. Dreher. But they're making masks into a sort of totem, a condensed symbol of their fear. He's a fierce conservative, but no fan of Trump. And he worries what all of this says about today's America. I think what the virus has done has been to pull the veil back uh, from over some real problems in this country, some real divisions, class divisions, cultural divisions, racial divisions, religious divisions, you name it. These divisions have been developing for quite some time, but our great wealth and uh, our political stability have papered over a lot of it. Well, now that wealth is going away and uh, we have a deadly virus out there and we can't hide uh, from these divisions anymore. We live in a country of freedom. We don't live in a country where the government tells us how to take care of our health. And stand for Washington, D.C. But At a Washington, small DC, reopened D.C. rally in Washington last week, the mask divide was underlined. Today. They're based off the numbers Andrew Cuomo himself gave. Rally organizer They're Suzanne Monk told us what she thinks every time she sees Donald Trump not wearing a mask. I feel like I can see him talking and I appreciate being able to see my president talk rather than not. I, I feel confident that he feels confident. So it builds confidence because the mask actually also builds fear. Through fear and intimidation. It's a view reinforced by big time Trump backing commentators who've taken to slamming those who insist that masks help. Well, by the way, they'll say this whole mask thing is settled science, just like they do with climate change. Of course, it's not. And they know it. The United States, more than any other country, has made the virus a matter of culture. 
Author David Frum is, like Dreer, a conservative and a Trump critic. He says, for millions of Trump supporters, wearing a mask has come to be seen as an untenable betrayal. And so on that basis, they will not. It's an act of criticism of the president. It's an act that suggests you don't think that Donald Trump is doing a good job. If you are a Trump supporter, to wear a mask means to admit, I made a big mistake in 2016. And people don't like to admit, I made a big mistake. Meanwhile, Trump continues his mask-free presidency. I think uh, wearing a face mask as I greet presidents, prime ministers, dictators, kings, queens, I don't know, somehow I don't see it for myself. Others, he underlines, can do what they want. But this is his choice, his example. I think what we're seeing here is um, what the world looks like when America fails to lead, when, when the government of the United States is in unworthy hands. It is desperately important that we be able to stick together and to help each other through this and not be at each other's throats. But uh, who would have imagined that something as, as anodyne as a mask would become such a flashpoint? And indeed, for the moment, a flashpoint it is. In a country divided evermore, while the virus rages. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. When we come back, we return to our top story. What went wrong in that deadly snowbird plane crash? We have an expert standing by. And later, the legacy of a retail giant. What this pandemic means for the future of the Bay. Welcome back. We have more in our top story, the sudden and deadly crash of a Canadian snowbird jet in Kamloops, British Columbia. Two planes took off this morning from Kamloops Airport just outside the city. Within seconds, one was clearly in trouble, entering a steep dive. The jet crashed into a quiet residential neighborhood, bursting into flames. We now know one member of the Canadian Forces Snowbirds team is dead, another injured. The investigation into why this all happened still in the early stages. And we're joined once again by Mark Miller, an aviation journalist who spent several years working and flying with the Snowbirds and, and has made documentaries about the team. And, and Mark, let's start with what we can see in the video when the jet steeply climbs. You touched on this with Anita, but what's likely going on at that moment? Yeah, the, the, that's called a zoom. Uh, basically, in takeoff, you're at kind of a low energy state. And if you do have a problem, uh, we say in aviation that uh, airspeed is life and altitude is life insurance. And so basically he was trying to convert his airspeed into some extra insurance to try to figure out what was going wrong. And normally at the top of that zoom, if you can't get the problem sorted out, you should punch out, eject basically. So that zoom does tell us likely that there was a problem that the pilot identified that he's trying to get that altitude. Now let's talk about ejecting. That, that, that's a split second decision. Absolutely, and I've been through the training for that, and I've flown in F-18s, I've flown with the Snowbirds uh, countless times, I've flown the jet myself. You do go through the training, um, you do think about it, and uh, fortunately I've never had to do it. I know many, many people who have had to punch out, and it's, um, it's, it's something that you cannot hesitate to do. You must do it as quickly as possible, uh, or uh, the results can be catastrophic, honestly. And as far as we know, this was not in the midst of an aerobatic procedure. This was two jets simply taking off from Kamloops on their way to Comox on Vancouver Island. So should have been just a routine takeoff. And all of a sudden, you're making these split-second life and death decisions. Yeah, it was just a transit flight. They were just moving from Kamloops off to Comox, where many of us were hoping to meet up with them and, and celebrate this amazing trip they've made across Canada. And it's helped raise our spirits. And, of course, now we're... Uh, you know, we're doing something different tonight. You know the Snowbird community so well. What is the impact on that group of a fatal crash? There are about 80 people on the Snowbird team right now. Uh, that includes technicians and, and, uh, and pilots. And uh, everybody's hurting tonight. And, um, you know, that's 80 people on the team right now, plus the hundreds and hundreds of people who've been involved with the team since it started 50 years ago. Um, everybody's hurting tonight. Everybody's thinking about the families involved and thinking about supporting everybody else. Um, but, you know, in aviation, we all know the risks. We all understand it. And, you know, many people are asking, well, is this, you know, is this the, you know, worth it for the snowbirds to continue to do this? And 
I believe it really is. It inspires people. It inspired me as a young boy when I was nine, the first time I saw the snowbirds, to get into aviation and, and to pursue it. And uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing what, what the team accomplishes every year. Mark Miller, we really appreciate your insights tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We have to take a break, but when we come back, the uncertain future of a Canadian institution, what the COVID-19 pandemic could mean for the Hudson's Bay Company, and later sharing some neighborly love, how this crisis has changed one street for the better. Twenty twenty should have been an epic celebration for the Hudson's Bay Company. Canada's iconic retailer is marking its three hundred and fiftieth anniversary. But as Cameron McIntosh shows us, even before its stores were shuttered by COVID nineteen, there were questions about the company's future. This ship really was kind of the start of what became the Hudson's Bay Company. And for historian Amelia Fay, the beginning of Canada as we know it. That's a replica of the Nonsuch, the very first ship of what would become the Hudson's Bay Company. If this ship had sunk, things would look completely different. It might be a completely different story. The Manitoba Museum had plans to mark HBC's 350th anniversary until COVID-19. It's a, a bummer for sure, because um, the, there's a lot I wanted to say. In many ways, the story of the Bay is the story of Canada. Its exploration and expansion opened up more than a third of the country often at the expense of Indigenous people. Whether you like the history or not, it's, it's part of our history. The 17th century fur trader grew into a 20th century retail giant. Come on, Canada, meet you at the Bay. But its future, this century, is far from certain. Struggling in the online world, last year HBC lost more than a billion dollars. Because the more you feel, the more you live. In February, it went private and is making moves towards becoming a luxury retailer. I think that we are going to see a, a downsizing in the footprint, in this case of the Hudson Bay Company. Retail analyst Craig Patterson says the brand and properties are valuable. HBC's future could be in partnering with other retailers inside of its stores. He's looking at basically running as a concession business where um, different departments will be run by different vendors and uh, the Hudson Bay Company to a degree will become a landlord. It's reinvented itself in tough times before. After all, it was during the Spanish flu pandemic that it laid the foundation of its department store business. That's the kind of the greatest thing about the company and how they were able to survive this long, I think, is because they did evolve. Remember, the non-such started on rough waters. Three and a half centuries later, HBC hasn't sunk yet. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. After the break, putting a new twist on that neighborhood potluck. And it's all about the connection that we need with each other. How one street is coming together at a safe distance. That's next in our moment. Having all your neighbors over for dinner might not seem like a smart idea right now, but as this BC neighborhood shows us, it doesn't mean you can't still dine with them. How many times have you heard the refrain, stay together by staying apart? Well, once a week in a Coquitlam neighborhood, people are doing both of those things at once and they're supporting others while they're at it. Tonight, that's our moment. It's connecting basically with our neighbors because we haven't been able to with COVID-19. We always get out outside for what we call driveway beers. So and we just kind of decided that since this is all going on and everything's kind of shut back, we'd support some local businesses. So in one restaurant and one brewery a week. Yay! We started out with eight, went to 10, went to 11, and then this week's 15, 16 families. We all get our pots and pans out and we, we celebrate those people who are taking care of us. This is all about the connection that we need with each other. Yeah, we've got a pretty good community here in Coquitlam. Cheers to all my neighbors. This has been awesome. Cheers to them for sure. You can see them clanging pots and pans at 7 o'clock, like many places across the country. In my neighborhood, somebody sets off fireworks every night at 7.02, and there's a guy playing the trumpet. You know who you are. And it brings the neighborhood together, I think, for the most part. But we don't have driveway beers like the people in Coquitlam, so good for them. That is the National for May 17th. Good night.